So I have the pleasure of welcoming everyone to our Animals Caught in Human Conflicts panel. My name is Erica Lyman. I'm a clinical professor of law at Lewis and Clark Law School. I'm also the director of our Global Law Alliance for Animals and the Environment. I'm really looking forward to our speakers today. But first, I want to give a special thank you to our platinum sponsors, the Brooks Institute of Animal Rights Law and Policy and Carroll House Furniture. This session this morning is going to explore a relatively common theme, human wildlife conflict, but we're going to explore the issue from the animal's perspective. So through a different lens, a lens that doesn't often get a lot of attention. From an animal's perspective, the ways in which animals are caught in human conflict are myriad. As, animal, as humans fight each other, um, as they fight our forested frontiers, and as they fight for market share in both legal and illegal marketplaces, animals suffer. So our goal today is to look at some of these scenarios and explore the consequences to animals, as well as to look at the human response to this suffering, comparing where government responses are weak and where government responses may be viewed as innovative and strong. The issue is one that's particularly interesting for me, having spent time working in Angola over the last five years. We often hear about Botswana's number of elephants that roam free, but what's little known is that some of those elephants are there because they've escaped Angola's civil war. The southeastern portion of Angola was heavily mined during the war, and only recently, thanks to organizations like Halo Trust, has the area been cleared, creating an opportunity, along with the new development of stronger legal frameworks, the rule of law and enforcement of those laws for elephants to hopefully once again roam wide and free in Angola. So we're gonna elaborate on some of those concepts during this panel, which I'm really excited about. Our three exceptional advocates and presenters today are going to dig deeper into these topics for us. Rachel Bale is a journalist who's been covering wildlife exploitation for the past seven years, most recently as National Geographic's executive editors at the executive editor of the Animals Desk. She's covered cheetah trafficking in the Horn of Africa, reef destruction in the South China Sea, helmeted hornbill poaching in Indonesia, and many more um, contemporary and current topics. Today, her presentation will showcase the myriad ways armed conflict affects animals, demonstrating how peace and animal protection are inextricably linked. Taylor Tench will follow up Rachel's presentation, speaking today about the illegal killing of orangutans in Indonesia and how the current policies of the Indonesian government are failing to address the killing and associated population declines. Taylor is a senior policy analyst at the Environmental Investigation Agency, where he coordinates and implements campaigns to protect rhinos, orangutans, and elephants from poaching, trafficking, and habitat loss. Finally, we're gonna hear from Gladys Kamasanyu. Gladys is a chief magistrate with the Uganda Judiciary. She is currently head of Africa's first and only specialized wildlife court, the Uganda Wildlife Court. Gladys has successfully adjudicated many high profile wildlife cases involving elephant ivory, pangolin scales, rhino horns, and hippopotamus teeth. Gladys holds an LLM degree in animal law from Lewis and Clark Law School. You can read more about our presenters and their amazing work online um, at the Animal Law Conference website. And with that, I'd like Rachel um, to come on up and kickstart our panel. So in 2019, Jane Goodall was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. And this, you may remember, was pretty controversial because, well, most of her work um, has been on animal behavior and conservation. But as the executive editor of National Geographic's Animals Desk, it was my job to commission a story to get it pre-written so if and when she won, I could, you know, publish it right away. We can actually go to the next slide. Um, 
And it got me thinking a lot about the links between conflict and conservation and between peace and animal protection. And that's when I realized only two environmentalists have ever won the Nobel Peace Prize. And that was Al Gore for his work on climate change and Wangari Maathai for her work on sustainable development. So Jane Goodall's nominators had said, the reason it makes sense for her to be nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize is because her life's quest is about global harmony. She didn't win that year, but the point was clear. The well being of humans and the well being of animals are inextricably linked. Armed conflict has occurred in two thirds of the world's biodiversity hotspots in the, uh, in the past 60 years, and conflicts are becoming increasingly protracted. But the challenges that armed conflicts pose to animals are often not addressed by traditional um, animal advocacy organizations. But what we know now is that we have to understand not only the consequences that armed conflict has on animals, but the pathways that lead to those consequences in order to understand how to help them. Go to the next slide. Um, so my presentation is going to give an overview of some of the ways animals are affected by armed conflicts with three goals in mind. The first is just to think about the wide range of ways that armed conflict does affect animals. The second is to illustrate just how intertwined the well-being of people and the well-being of animals is. And the third is to come to better appreciate the really complex social, ecological, and economic ways that conflict affects animals. So just a quick aside, you'll notice I have a picture here of the rescue of Masha the brown bear. She was, uh, she's a European brown bear who had been rescued from a circus in Ukraine years ago and was living in the countryside. And when the war in Ukraine started, she had to be evacuated. It was very dramatic, um, you know, uh, just as dramatic as when we we're seeing people like line up with the borders with their pets and things like that. Um, and when we published this story on National Geographic's website, a lot of the emails I got from people are, why are you doing these stories on animals when people are suffering? And this may be something you guys hear a lot in your own work too, like why focus on animals when there's just as like, you know, people. <laughs> basically. Um, and my answer is always the same. It's, it's the economic principle of specialization, essentially, right? If you have the expertise, the funding, and the mandate to do thing A, that's where your efforts are best spent. It doesn't mean you're taking away resources from something else. But on the flip side, when I talk to groups um, like you guys, anybody who's like a hardcore animal lover, I like to make the opposite point and remind people that um, helping people also is critical to helping animals. So for example, a community that has a good harvest is less likely to go out illegally hunting for wild meat. A family with a healthy herd of cattle is less likely to retaliate if a lion kills one of their herd in the middle of the night. And a mother who has a secure income is less likely to harbor poachers. The point is we have to care about both animals and people in order to move forward. Um, it's practically impossible to list all of the ways that, um, sorry, does this, is this supposed to go forward and back? Or should I just keep saying go forward on the slide? <laughs> I don't know. Green button, thank you. Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> so some of the obvious some ways are really obvious. You've got landmines and bombs and destruction of homes and habitat, the breakup of family. These are all the same things you think of as how war affects humans is also how war affects animals. But there are some less obvious, more indirect ways as well. And those mainly have to do with the way conflict affects the interactions between people and animals. So quick example, what happens when humans and animals are fleeing to the same spaces and end up in the same spot. So over the next few slides, I'm gonna give a few examples of different conflicts and how they illustrate uh, the different types of effects on wildlife. 
So first, the Vietnam War is a really good example of the direct effects of armed conflict on animals. And Agent Orange is the most obvious thing. Um, you know, it's an herbicide that was used to defoliate the jungle. So gorillas had nowhere to hide and to destroy agricultural fields. So gorillas and rural people who supported them didn't have a food source. And the effects of Agent Orange on humans in the long term have been really well studied since then. But I was really surprised to find that the long term effects on animals haven't been. Um, still, some things are pretty obvious. Um, we know that the use of Agent Orange led to the painful poisoning death of many mammals and birds and reptiles, and lots of endemic species in Vietnam, a super biodiverse country um, that are found nowhere else in the world. It led to mass fish deaths, which was not only a problem for the fish, but messed up the entire food chain. Um, and then the animals that didn't immediately die were left either starving or had lost habitat because Agent Orange was used over 3 million hectares of forest. And one of the biggest unknowns, something I hadn't really thought about until I started working on this presentation, um, some scientists have pointed out nobody's really studied the long-term effects on soil creatures like um, earthworms or ants. And these are the animals that underpin the entire biochemical cycle of a tropical rainforest, and we don't know what's happened to them. So while chemical warfare at this scale hasn't occurred since, a lot of the effects are similar to what we see with conventional tactics. Bombs and explosives kill animals, destroy their habitat, and pollute the land, water, and air. Um, so for decades, uh, Virunga National Park in the Democratic Republic of Congo has been a virtual war zone. Um, initially, the greater Virunga landscape had the highest biomass of large animals uh, anywhere in the world. This included um, the now endangered mountain gorillas, hippos, elephants, okapi, all kinds of animals. But since the 1994 Rwandan genocide, which was quickly followed by the first and second Congolese wars, it's been filled with militia groups in near constant fighting. These groups train and fight in Virunga and more than 200 rangers in the past 25 years have died trying to protect the park and its animals. But these militia groups don't just train and fight in the forest, they also have to eat there. So we have seen mass slaughter of gorillas, hippos, fish, not only for them to feed themselves, but also to sell to urban centers where wild meat is still considered a delicacy and people will pay big money for it. So let's take hippos for an example. Um, Lake Edwards in Virunga used to have 29,000 hippos, more hippos than anywhere else in the world. But after poaching both for their meat and for their teeth, which are treated like ivory, it wiped out 95% of their numbers. And today, and this is a number people are excited about, there, only, there are 1,500. Um, chronic instability because of the fighting around Lake Edwards has meant increasing lawlessness. So, there's been an increase in demand for fish from the lake, which is the center of the area's economy. And because of all the fighting, there are very few income alternatives to fishing. It's always been a fishing focused economy, but now there's very little else you could do even if you wanted to. So with all of, all of the fighting, the few choices in income and the fact that government institutions that, regulate, um, that regulated the fishery are virtually absent, that fishery was nearing collapse. And militias were also able to take advantage of this fact. They fished to feed themselves, but they also charged a tax to fishermen to be able to access the lake. We can't talk about Central Africa and not talk about elephants and ivory. Um, I think we all know elephants are targeted for their ivory um, to help fund uh, militia activities. But these really smart, sensitive creatures knew when the fighting started to flee. And Virunga went from having 8,000 elephants in the 1950s to, and again, this is a much celebrated number because 600 just came back a couple of years ago, 
700 elephants. Same thing that Erica mentioned we saw in Angola when the war started. A lot of elephants fled south into Botswana where there was less poaching and where peace meant there were fewer habitat incursions, less noise pollution, flying bullets, etc. So one more example I'd like to give, the last example I'd like to give is the civil war in Somalia, which nicely encapsulates both direct and indirect effects. So like in Virunga, when the civil war in Somalia started, we saw mass migrations of animals, cheetahs, foxes, all kinds of gazelles, they either fled east to Ethiopia or south to Kenya. And then those that remained were left with very, very little habitat. And that's for a couple of reasons. Again, weakened and collapsed institutions couldn't stop the, um, couldn't stop illegal logging for charcoal. And you also have the phenomenon of displaced Somalis who are primarily pastoralists, make a living herding goats and camel, were forced to flee into areas that had previously been animal only habitat, which meant now you had domestic animals and wild animals competing for the same grazing land and domestic animals, wild animals and humans competing for the same food sources, food and land. Similarly, an interesting thing in Somalia was um, arms proliferation. As guns flowed into the country during the Civil War, it was super easy to get a gun, both for fighters and for regular people. And this led to a huge increase in subsistence hunting. This was a problem not only for the target animals, but for the larger animals that relied on um, the smaller animals that were hunted as their prey base. And lastly, the civil war in Somalia threw open the door to the illegal wildlife trade. Um, aside from arms proliferation, you had new airstrips popping up, which created new trade routes. You had little law enforcement, which meant that people who were involved in the trade had virtually no fear of getting caught. And you've got a feedback loop of um, you know, more trade means people got more expertise in handling animals and keeping them alive which made them more efficient traffickers. There are select cases where conflict has had positive effects on animals, such as the DMZ in Korea or um, FARC in Colombia keeping out illegal loggers, but these are few and far between and are increasingly the exception, not the rule. So just as I was finishing putting together this presentation, I. Um, came across ecologist Caitlin Gaynor's 2016 paper, uh, which is about animals and armed conflict. And it made a much nicer chart than the one that I had been attempting to make on my own in PowerPoint. So I put that up here because it's a nice summary of the dozens of ways that armed conflict affects animals and their habitat. This is again, ranging from direct military action, like bombing and poaching to fund military activities, to indirect effects, things that affect humans, which in turn impact animals and their environments. And it's only by understanding the complex ways that all of these factors interact, can we begin to come up with useful strategies for mitigating the effects of conflict on animals. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as Erica mentioned earlier, my name is Taylor Tench, and I'm a senior wildlife policy analyst with the Environmental Investigation Agency. For those who may not be familiar, the Environmental Investigation Agency, or EIA, is a nonprofit organization with offices in DC and London that works to investigate and expose environmental crime and take that information to campaign for better protection of the environment and better enforcement of the law. Uh, we work on three major issues, forests, wildlife, and climate. Today, I'll be talking to you about wildlife and specifically Asia's only species of grade ape, orangutans. First, some basic information about orangutans. There are three species, which are found only on the islands of Borneo and Sumatra in Malaysia and Indonesia. They're the Bornean orangutan, the Sumatran orangutan, and the Tapanuli orangutan. I realize we stole the pig up here, so I will go to an orangutan. Maybe. 
Oh, yeah. Boom. There we go. Um, so all orangutan species are classified as critically endangered by the IUCN, and all are experiencing population declines. The Bornean orangutan is the most numerous with a population of about 60,000. There are about 14,000 Sumatran orangutans surviving in the northern part of the island of Sumatra, mostly in and around the looser ecosystem. Um, and the Tapanuli orangutan, which was only described as a distinct species uh, in 2017, numbers at less than 800 individuals. Um, and these figures are stark declines from about 300 plus thousand orangutans that were surviving in Indonesia in about the, the 1970s. So there are two main threats that are pushing orangutans closer to extinction, habitat loss and illegal killing. The conversion of forest for agricultural production, including oil palm plantations and for pulp and paper monoculture tree plantations comes with construction of new infrastructure for things like roads, which in turn gives people increased access to previously difficult to reach forests. It also results in the loss of shelter and fruit bearing trees which forces orangutans to search for new habitat and new sources of food. This brings orangutans into contact with people. When this happens, things typically end one of two ways. The government might come in and capture and relocate the orangutan, which comes with its own set of problems and conservation challenges that it don't have time to go into today. Um, and, and the other thing that may happen is that people simply eliminate the orangutan themselves. On average, approximately 2,300 Bornean orangutans are killed every single year. And I'm referring here to direct killings by people as opposed to indirect losses associated with things like disease or starvation or other consequences of habitat destruction. And now people kill orangutans for several reasons. Sometimes it happens when an orangutan is randomly encountered in the forest um, and it's killed out of maybe fear or simply for sport. They're also killed intentionally, sometimes for their meat, and sometimes to obtain an infant orangutan, which can fetch a high price on the black market. But one of the most common reasons orangutans are killed is due to conflict with people. Orangutans that have been forced to search for food and shelter after their natural forest habitat is destroyed often end up feeding on crops planted by people, both industrial agriculture like oil palm, but also village farms and gardens. Uh, and air rifles are one of the most, are the, one of the primary methods used to deter and kill orangutans from feeding in, in these village gardens and farms. Uh, air rifles shoot these small little pellets that are designed to take down small game, but have proven similarly effective uh, when targeted at orangutans. This uh, x-ray image um, on the screen behind me is of an adult female Sumatran orangutan named Hope that was brought to a rescue center in Sumatra after being discovered in the forest, extremely malnourished and with over 70 air rifle pellets uh, lodged in her body. And you can see, see the dots pretty, pretty clearly in this X-ray image. Uh, the veterinarians at this facility were able to save her life um, and, and she did survive and is living at her life in a sanctuary. Uh, unfortunately, when she was brought in, she also had a one month old baby orangutan that did not survive the attack. And so these illegal killings can have devastating effects on orangutan populations. Orangutans have extremely slow reproductive cycles and females typically don't breed till around the ages of 10 to 15 and then only give birth about once every eight years. Because of this, studies have shown that the loss of just 1% of female orangutans from a given population can cause that population to decline. So consequently, illegal killing is a huge driver of orangutan loss. In a landmark study, uh, that came out a couple of years ago that identified 150,000 orangutans having been lost in Borneo between 1999 and 2015, determined that while most dramatic declines happen in areas of high deforestation, overall, the majority of orangutan loss took place in intact primary forest and selectively logged forest due to hunting and conflict with people. So killing orangutans is not only brutal, it's not only harmful to the long-term survival of the species, but it's also illegal in Indonesia. All three orangutan species are protected under Indonesia's conservation law of 1990, which authorizes a maximum penalty of five years imprisonment and a fine of up to about 6,700 US dollars for killing, capturing, trading, um, and possessing an orangutan. By global wildlife conservation legislation standards, this, this isn't bad, it's actually pretty strong. The problem though, 
is implementation, or really the lack thereof. Orangutan-related crimes are rarely prosecuted in Indonesia, and even on the off chance that they are, the penalties applied are, are typically extremely weak. And again, by orangutan-related crimes, I'm talking about killing, capture, trade, and possession. So I'm going to throw a couple of statistics out at you now, so bear with me. Um, an analysis of over 700 Borean orangutan-related crimes committed in the 10 years between 2007 and 2017 by a team of orangutan conservationists led by Julie Sherman at the NGO Wildlife Impact found that only four resulted in convictions, a rate of less than 1%. Indonesia's conservation law was adopted in 1990, so it's been enforced for over 30 years. And during that time, no one has ever received the maximum penalty allowed for committing an orangutan-related crime. So while these crimes are rarely prosecuted, there are a couple instances that kind of buck this trend and may actually generate a response from the Indonesian authorities. That's number one, when a particularly violent incident of, or of orangutan killing, like the case of Hope, uh, generates international media outrage and there's a reputational risk they have to uh, address, or in cases of orangutan trafficking, specifically illegal international trade of orangutans. The vast majority of orangutan trade, illegal trade, is actually domestic in Indonesia, uh, but the cases of international trafficking are more high profile and thus garner the attention of the authorities and, and force them to act. So this image uh, of the orangutan in the basket on the screen is from a case a couple of years ago in which this juvenile uh, Sumatran orangutan was attempted to be trafficked from Bali to Russia. And so Sumatran orangutans obviously don't occur naturally in Bali. So it was trafficked from Sumatra first to Bali and then attempted to go to Russia. Uh, the orangutan was seized and it survived, was rescued. It's, it's doing OK. Um, and the Russian national who attempted to smuggle it was prosecuted. But the prosecutor was only seeking a six month prison sentence for this crime. The judge determined this was too lenient and sentenced him to a month, or sorry, a year in prison instead. And so, just as orangutan conflict killing is closely related to habitat loss, illegal orangutan trade is a byproduct of illegal killing of orangutans because infant orangutans stay with their mothers for the first eight years of their lives. There's, there's no circumstances in, in nature where a baby orangutan can be found by itself. Thus, every infant orangutan in trade means at least two orangutans were removed from the wild, the baby itself and the mother that had to be killed to obtain that orangutan. And this is more common than, than many people realize. Baby orangutans are often kept as pets in rural villages in Indonesia, uh, located in orang orangutan habitat. Uh, in many cases, this is you know, villagers trying to save a baby orangutan after the mother's been killed. Um, but orangutan possession is illegal and again is almost never prosecuted. Now, this isn't to say the captured orangutans always stay as pets in these villages. Um, there are a number of Indonesian NGOs that work with the government to rescue these orangutans um, and confiscate them from these individuals. But the problem is that the Indonesian government has a policy whereby individuals are allowed to voluntarily hand over these orangutans, and there's no criminal liability if they do so. So the Indonesian government will take an orangutan, drop it off at a rescue center, and consider it job done, conservation win, move on to the next thing. But by failing to prosecute these crimes and investigate what other crimes may have been committed to obtain this orangutan in the first place, the government's sending a clear signal that orangutan crimes are not a priority and they're extremely and exceptionally low risk. So better enforcement is obvious. It's, it's obviously needed, it's necessary, but it has to be done sensibly and take into account all the relevant circumstances in each case. Prosecuting every single poor villager with a pet orangutan is, is going to backfire and, not, and not, be, not produce the results we'd like to see. But cases do need to be prosecuted and the results need to be publicized appropriately to deter future crimes. Now, a good place to start here could be fully prosecuting high-ranking government officials that have pet orangutans, which often do so with impunity. Um, and in addition to enforcing better enforcement of Indonesia's orangutan conservation laws, another part of the solution is simply preventing the loss of more orangutan habitat to help prevent orangutans from wandering into contact with people in the first place. More than 80% of Borneo orangutans are found outside of protected areas in Indonesia, which obviously presents a huge risk to their future survival. 
And even in their nominally protected areas, there aren't enough Ministry of Environment personnel a lot of the times to effectively patrol these areas. So while establishing formal parks and reserves is certainly one way to protect orangutan habitat, the solution is politically fraught in Indonesia, uh, to say the least. But there are often other more effective ways to protect habitat. Uh, one of these is awarding indigenous peoples and local communities their legal right to own and manage their ancestral forests located within orangutan habitat. So last point I'll mention here is that there's this other complicating issue that kind of looms over all of this. And that's Indonesia's sensitivity to criticism of its policies and criticism of its views on the health of its ecosystems and wildlife. No matter how robust or comprehensive or peer reviewed the evidence that's presented to them is. There have been a number of cases in recent years where NGOs and scientists have been penalized by the government just for, for doing their jobs. In 2019, for example, WWF had a conservation agreement terminated in Sumatra because they said some things that were critical of wildfires in Indonesia. A year later, a very well-respected French scientist and ecologist uh, was deported after he published a study using satellite imagery to show that the area affected by wildfires in Indonesia in the 2019 fire season was actually much greater than what the government had acknowledged. And just a couple months ago, in September, a group of orangutan scientists published an op-ed in the Jakarta Post, which is a very prominent publication in Indonesia, that was pushing back on some claims the Minister of Environment had made a couple of weeks earlier saying orangutans aren't close to extinction um, and they're actually growing in number. And the government's response was to ban these scientists from uh, doing conservation work in parks and protected areas in Indonesia. So just to wrap things up and summarize, the ongoing loss, fragmentation, and degradation of orangutan forest habitat is increasing human access to these forests and pushing orangutans closer to people. This leads to human orangutan conflict. More conflict means more killing, and the ineffective policies of the government to safeguard orangutan habitat and prosecute the people perpetrating these crimes has perpetuated these problems. And, the Ind and Indonesia's defensiveness over its policies and their effectiveness exacerbates everything. So this is a pretty daunting scenario, but there is, there is hope. The rate of deforestation in Indonesia has fallen significantly since 2017 and so far has been staying down. There's a vibrant community of Indonesian civil society organizations working every day to protect orangutans and other threatened wildlife, to protect habitat, to hold their government and industry to account, and to help indigenous peoples and local communities secure their rights to own and manage their forests. And the government's recent decision to ban these scientists has been met with significant backlash in Indonesia by civil society, by academia, and even the general public. And finally, as I mentioned earlier, Indonesia does have strong wildlife protection laws on the books. They just need to be implemented effectively. Doing so could go a long way to helping these, uh, to help secure the long-term survival of these species. And Indonesia has the capacity and the expertise in law enforcement and wildlife management to do this. They just need the political will. Thank you. I, I bring you greetings from Uganda, the pearl of Africa. And I am glad to be here this morning to talk about a topic of great importance today in the world. Uh, we have a brief overview uh, about what I'll be talking about. And okay. Yeah, so that is the overview, and I'll be sharing about um, human wildlife conflict, the causes of that conflict, uh, the role of governments around the world. I will briefly highlight the achievements of the works of the Uganda Wildlife Court today. Um, for sure, everything we do out there in the world affects the natural world and everything we do brings about conflict, conflict between us and others who we share the planet with and which leads us today to human wildlife conflict. And human wildlife conflict 
is those encounters or when our encounters as humans and wildlife lead to negative consequences, negative effects, and these include loss of property for us as humans when wildlife destroys our property, injuries, we have had so many people injured by wildlife, loss of life, many people killed, but a lot of wildlife killed by humans in many of these conflicts. Whether wildlife does anything to us or not, we kill them. Um, and usually it is because we are looking for space. They want the same space. We're looking for food. We want the same food with them. Uh, our livestock wants the same food with them or we want them for food. So where we stay in this natural world, the world is not increasing, it's not expanding, but our population as human beings is growing every day. And therefore, because of the so much growth of the population, we need where to live. We need where to stay. We need more space for us. We need more space for those who will come after us. And what this is leading to is conflict with those who are already there, the non-human wildlife that is there, the same space they are supposed to be in, we want it, and therefore leading to conflict. Um, and these interactions increase as our population grows every day. We keep interacting with them. Those of, our, those of us who come from Africa, where I come from, uh, those of us who have had a benefit of growing up in rural areas, uh, know that the space we used to see, the natural wild we used to see has all gone. When I go back to my village where I grew up from, I keep looking for those big trees. I keep looking, wanting to hear those voices of the beautiful birds that sang uh, as we grew up. The waters that we saw, where we drew water to survive, where we grazed the cows, the forests that we saw, where we went through when we went to school, they have all gone. We put them down. I don't see any. Um, what, ha what it has led to is exactly what we see, and this is not a rare photo where I come from. We have a lot of wildlife put down. The habitats are going because we want to grow our own crops to eat. So these are their homes where they are supposed to live. And we are putting the trees down. We are putting the forest down because we need space to grow crops for ourselves. And we are aware that there are some of those individuals who cannot co continue to exist, especially if the ecosystem has been affected. It has been altered so much that they cannot live. And when we alter the ecosystem, there's not anything that we can do to bring back the biodiversity. We can't do anything. Even if we walk up and say, oh, we're planting back the trees. We can't plant them back. We can't, bring, we can't bring back all those individuals who live there. The ones we see and those ones we don't see. So all that is sending so many species into extinction. Um, uh, there are many, iconic, actually world is iconic um, species that have gone. For the case of Uganda, where I come from, that is an okapi animal, very beautiful. Who wouldn't want to see that one every time, every day, and all, you know, generations to have a chance to see. We lost that one. Uh, it is believed to have been uh, in the 1970s when we last had them in the wild. They have gone into total extinction. You can't find them in Uganda today. You can't. And it's because of the conflicts that we have had with wildlife in my country that of course there are other countries that have lost a lot of these individuals. And in the 70s, in the 80s, Uganda had a very big civil war that took ages. So that is when many of these individuals were hunted down 
not just by us who are Ugandans or live in Uganda, but even outsiders took advantage because our national parks were turned into battlegrounds during that time and many of the animals went. Uh, those are rhinos, yeah. <laughs> we lost the rhinos in the 80s, again, during the civil war. Uh, currently we have 31 individuals who are raised in a sanctuary, who are watched by humans 24 seven. I have been to that sanctuary many times and all the time you find a rhino in that sanctuary in the wild moving, it's a fenced, a sanctuary that is a human being moving with a rhino. When the rhino rests, the human being rests. When the rhino is moving and feeding, the human being is feeding. And why? Because they fear that if they're not there guarding the rhino with a gun, another human will come and take the horn. And you can't take the horn from a rhino. The rhino has to die to get a horn. Uh, those are elephants. Um, again, in the 1980s, we lost almost all the elephants. In Uganda, we had only about 700 individuals that we have been since then struggling to raise. And right now we have about 7,000 in our wild. So, and all that came because of the conflicts during the war, the civil war, but also uh, because of struggle for space, struggle for food, we want to graze our cows, we want to grow crops, and therefore we end up altering the ecosystem, we end up killing them and all that. And actually today in some of the African countries, especially the, South, the Southern African countries, but also in Uganda, we have these animals in towns. Last year we had a case where a family of elephants came out of the park and it was in the town moving and people were running and they were also running because they didn't know what was happening. Yeah, so because we have encroached so much on their space where they lived, uh, that has happened. So we're not yet doing well. We haven't done good to avert the problem. But I'm aware that many governments out there in the world are doing something, they're working hard to solve the problem. In Uganda, where I come from, we have had some interventions. For example, we have had fencing of our national parks. And of course, where I come from in Uganda and some African countries, if not all, we don't have all our wildlife in national parks. Actually, in Uganda, half of it, 50% of the wildlife is on private land. So you can imagine living on private land, privately acquired and owned land, but government has a duty to ensure that they are safe even there. So the conflict of you're on my land, I must fend for my children. This is space for me to dig to keep my children alive. Those are physical and real. And all these lead to death of wildlife. We have had interventions of, um, of uh, laws being passed to make sure that these conflicts are resolved. For example, in our latest uh, wildlife law, the Uganda Wildlife Act of 2019, we have had within the law uh, established a wildlife uh, compensation scheme where uh, individuals who are injured by wildlife will go and seek for compensation from government for the deaths, for the injuries, for the loss of property, and somehow government will try to pay back, but you can't pay back life. But now ask me where an animal has been killed because of the conflict, how would we get back the life? We can't. So again, as one of the latest and biggest achievement that we have had in Uganda has been the establishment of Africa, Africa's only specialized wildlife court that is in Uganda the Uganda Wildlife Court, where we have taken a deliberate move to establish a court that is only for the first time committed to only hearing cases relating to wild animals. And uh, this court has 
such a limited jurisdiction in Uganda, whereby we try all cases arising from all corners of the country in one court that is located currently in Kampala. We have we had this court established because of so much outcry from um, stakeholders, from NGOs, from agencies who are in charge of wildlife conservation, who believed and actually were right to say that cases relating to animals, relating to their habitats were not being prioritized. And this was mainly because as we know, where you have all these put in one courthouse, put in one jacket and one judicial officer, and you know, by their nature, wildlife cases don't have a complainant, they don't have a victim, they have no one following to say, oh, it was my mother-in-law that was slaughtered uh, yesterday, it was my mother who was killed, it was my dad, I'm alone and all that, they're not crying to show that they are in pain, you only have prosecutors and other law enforcement agencies, you know, following, and uh, because of that, we had cases where victims are humans being uh, prioritized as opposed to cases where animals are involved. So the court was established to bring about ex expeditious trials, to bring about uniformity, to bring about, to cut down the cost that was originally involved in trying these cases, um, to make sure that their benefits are accruing from these trials. For now, up to now, up to this month, we had over 2000 cases registered and tried at the court. And we think we are moving the right direction. Some of the benefits that have, been, have accru accrued from the court are the prioritization of the cases. Like I said, for the first time we have the court, we have judges who are dedicated to only hearing cases relating to animals. You have no choice, but that is the case that you have before you. And the object, the objective of establishing the court is to make sure these cases are given priority, they are heard expeditiously and completed. And then we have had increased arrests and prosecutions because right now agencies are aware that there is a court, there are judicial officers who are stationed there, they will hear our cases very fast. So we have arrests being effected and prosecutions going on and cases adjudicated upon very, very fast. Expeditious adjudications, these have mainly be, been because that is all we are dealing with. We are for the first time giving, you know, judgments, verdicts delivered timely. We don't have unnecessary delays. We don't have uh, lack of prioritization of the cases. So we think we're doing well. Uniformity in penalties, before we had all these cases tried everywhere. So you would have one judge give this penalty, another in another jurisdiction give another, and then you had a mess. So where we are in one house, we are together. There's a bit of uniformity in sentencing. Among the stakeholders, the users of the court, there is a lot of increased coordination, cooperation, uh, and communication because we know each other, we know who is responsible for what, and we are able to communicate anytime, any day, and seek for help where we need it. Now, because of this court, we are able to, for the first time, recognize those who have already been tried before a court. And I can tell you today that we have, for the first time, and I think in Africa, had a sentence of life imprisonment passed in Uganda for a case involving wildlife. And this was passed not, uh, uh, not long ago, but just last month on the 20th. So um, our act again provides for a penalty of up to life imprisonment. And this particular case was involving a man who had already been charged and convicted in the same court in the 2017. And last year, he was again brought back to court for same offenses of elephant ivory. And uh, he was convicted again and sentenced to life imprisonment. It's 
it's a, it's a sentence that I passed and I have up to now not regretted about it. Of course, it came with a lot of mixed reactions. We had human rights advocates say, no, a human being should not be going to prison for life for a mere animal. And I say, okay, now you're going to wake up to know that they are not just mere animals, but animals or individuals who are actually protected by the law in Uganda. And the law is being enforced. So we all have a role to play, but that's the problem. The challenge is big, but we can. At our respective levels, wherever we are, we can do something. And when all those small, small things are put together, we can make a difference. Collaborating and working together, pulling resources together, getting focused will remedy the situation. Animals do not speak but we can speak for them. And when we speak for animals, we speak for humanity. We make the world a safer and kinder place for us and animals. Thank you. Well, thank you for all of the fascinating um, and really informative presentations. I'm positive that some folks here have questions as well as our online viewers. If you're in person, please come up to the microphones. Um, if you're virtual, you can um, ask your question on the um, panel that you see on screen and it will be read. I, I can see right away that we have a virtual question. So I'll take that. Thank you. As it is, this question is for Taylor. As it is not illegal to keep orangutans as pets in Indonesia, how does the government control the well-being of these animals? Well, I think, as I mentioned, there are a number of conservation groups that are actively working in and around villages located near orangutan forests that get tips and information on orangutans that are being kept as pets and then alert the government to go remove these animals from their legal possession, um, which is done and they're brought to rescue centers and depending on the circumstances involving that individual orangutan, sometimes they can be rehabilitated and released, sometimes they have to live their lives um, in a rescue center facility. Um, but the issue comes with enforcement it's against the law to do this. It's against the law to obtain that orangutan by killing its mother. And that's where there's a breakdown of enforcement. So the care aspect is, is a constant challenge, but being addressed, but the enforcement aspect of it is, is where there's room for improvement. I see a question right here. Yeah. Uh, hello, um, my name is Altman Said. Uh, once again, uh, I'm an LLM and animal law student here. So my question is actually rather more philo philosophical because I think the the underpinnings of how we define animals, what they are, and then that translate into law. That's basically what we actually do. And uh, recently, very recently, and the case that we discussed here slightly about the the DRC reparations case that came out just this year in February 2022. Uh, that unfortunately declared animals as natural resources, and that's how they basically took other reparations. And for those who don't know, this status is actually very colonialistic, and it flows in, into international law since the 1500s. And there have been other standards proposed in wildlife that animals can be something like common public good or common heritage of mankind, things like these. So I just wanted to ask a question like, how should we work with the current standard that is here today and what should we change it to because uh, the philosophical underpinnings are is basically something that will dictate what the law will be and how we protect animals i know it's a bit global question but <laughs> i'm really grateful for an answer thank you does anyone want to want to take a stab at an answer maybe gladys you could speak uh, to it just from the perspective of your role as a magistrate in Uganda's wildlife court and, you know, whether the court is open to thinking about and the law in Uganda is open to thinking about wild animals, not necessarily just as natural resources, but as individual animals. I think I, I hear that being part of your question and how do we sort of engage in that principle shift in our work and in thinking about human wildlife conflict. Okay, um, 
basically like many or if not all African countries, uh, wildlife is mainly conserved because of the value that we get from it. And actually you'll find that all our laws have been enacted and only to provide for that. That is it. But as now animal advocates who know how these, who, want, who imagine how animals feel about all this, when we are handling these cases, I have seen my prosecutors before me, when they are giving their aggravating factors at the end of the trial where there is a conviction, they're going far to even tell you how much is involved beyond the value that the state accrues from the wildlife being alive, but the, the contribution of the wildlife when they're out there in the wild, they have intrinsic value and put it before a court, but also I have seen our experts in courts in their expert opinions put out that. And therefore in my decision as a judge, I have to make sure I recognize such a submission and make it come out in my judgment, but also during the time of sentencing, giving the punishment, I will, as I give reasons for coming up with such a sentence, also touch the value of this animal beyond the extrinsic value that we see, mm -hmm. beyond the value that a state knows it's they get from it. it. Yeah. yeah, interesting, thank you. I see another virtual question and then I'll take another in-person question. This one is for Gladys. How quickly do cases go to trial in the Ugandan Wildlife Court? Pardon me? How quickly do cases go to trial? So maybe from the point at which there's a charge to um, adjudication, like how quickly does that happen? You mentioned that it's a lot quicker now that yes. you have a specialized court. Yeah, because we have one court sessioned in one area covering the whole country, trying all cases from all over the country. We have made sure that all cases coming up, any day you fix, a, you fix a case for hearing, you must be present. And all witnesses coming must be heard before they go. So we don't have adjournments for witnesses are in court or judge is not around or for some reason we can't hear you go come back another day. So we have avoided that by giving where it is practicable day-to-day -day hearings to make sure the cases are expedited, they're hard and determined to the end. Now it's hard for me to say that we take one week because all cases are handled according to how they are. Some are complex, they involve a lot, some are easy, some people plead guilty and they end that day when they come up. Others are going full trial, but we are trying as much as possible to have them concluded at least within six months. Yeah. Longest case, six months be done and we have a verdict. Thank you, Gladys. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Manny Rutino. I'm an attorney for Earth Justice and I'm also the CEO of Climate Reform. And this question is for all three of you. Uh, I know that all of our heart breaks, uh, our hearts break when, when we see the wildlife, um, the violence that's inflicted on them by people in really tough situations. And I was really hoping that each of you can go into detail as to what brings people into those situations and what are some ways that we can potentially address those issues before they get to the point where they have to inflict violence on these animals, um, particularly because I think our hearts also break when we have to imprison individuals behind bars for an entire lifetime because they were placed in a situation where the only way that they could get potentially out of that really hard situation was through inflicting violence on, on others. Thanks. Thank you for the good question. Um, and there's sometimes a distinction, right, between sort of um, the systemic issues that drive some of the poachers to poach, for example, but then the opportunistic situations that some folks involved in wildlife crime um, are taking advantage of. So I'm curious um, maybe to hear from our panelists about that. And Rachel, do you want to share some reflections? Sure. Um, I can talk more about when it comes to communicating with the public about these kinds of issues, since as a journalist, that's mainly where I focus. Um, 
But I know, for example, at National Geographic, one of the things that we're constantly discussing when we're doing stories on, on any kind of violence against animals is what is that boundary between catching people's attention so that they care and being so graphic that they just turn away and don't even you know, want to engage with the story. And that, that comes up a lot, especially for our photographers, um, because lots of times there's not really middle ground between showing, you know, the animal alive in its habitat or, you know, slaughtered for whatever reason. Um, and I don't think we really have an answer for that, actually. I think it's, um, it's different by story, and it's honestly something we, we play around, you know, sort of a, a, a moving boundary that we play around with to see what what catches people's attention that doesn't push the boundary too far? Yeah, um, I think taking the orangutan example, there's kind of two things. One is, is, is protecting the habitat to begin with. So they're not coming into contact with people and then also investing in communities. Um, for the first part, uh, there are, there's a number of ways to protect forests in Indonesia um, at the local level and at the national level. And some national policies that have been instituted have been very good in the past, um, talking about bans on deforesting peatlands and primary forests and things like that. But there always seems to be loopholes. Um, these maps can be adjusted on a whim, or um, there was a recent law that was passed that's granting amnesty to companies, palm oil companies and mining companies that are operating illegally in forest habitats. But as long as they can get their permits done in three years, they, they're good to go. So it's it's like one step forward, two steps back a lot. And I think in addition to making the national laws more airtight and exploring some of these other ways to protect habitats um, that are maybe less bureaucratic and full of red tape, that can go a long way. Um, but also investing in these communities and giving them the tools and resources to live with these animals. Because um, you know, an orangutan coming in and eating your food source is a problem, but there's other options besides killing it or dumping it off in another forest and we don't know you know what happens to it then um so i think in addition to you know prosecuting particularly aggressive or egregious crimes it's giving these you know communities tools to deter orangutans compensation programs to live with them and really to just invest in these kinds of solutions that really haven't been so far um in Uganda, what we have done, and of course, I really understand your frustration. I myself hate being reactive. Like the work I do is more of, you know, I hand, I am at the end. And by the time the case comes to me, things have gone wrong. Life has been lost and we can't have it back. But we have had some interventions of, for example, increasing awareness in communities. We have NGOs that are in the in the country whose work is to increase awareness about wildlife protection to make uh, rural people be, know that anytime i cite a wild animal who, are, who has done nothing i must not just go before them and kill them because i suspect they may injure me the next day but also take trouble to call wildlife officers who are stationed within where we live to either come and take away the animal or see how to handle them. And uh, we have also had those interventions of fencing off the national parks to ensure that wild animals do not go out to the communities. And yeah, so some work is being done, but we are not yet doing well, for sure. Yes, the back. Oh, thank you. Um, my name is Yvonne. I'm also an animal lawyer from Zimbabwe. And my question, uh, I would like to know, how are you dealing with uh, wildlife offenders in terms of bail? Because we have issues where wildlife offenders get bail, then they don't attend court, they abscond. How do you deal with that in Uganda? Thank you. Okay, so in Uganda, wildlife, okay, we every person in Uganda has a right to apply for bail. It's constitutional, it's a right. But of course, courts have the discretion to either grant or to not grant, and where they don't grant, reasons must be given why. Now, for us, because our court covers the entire country, 
And we know that we're leaving this man to go back like uh, maybe a hundred kilometers, you know. Some of them will not even have the ability to come back. They don't have the money for transportation. They don't have, they will go and get lost there. So what we have done actually is instead to, prior, to prioritize trial. To make sure when the case comes up, we fix it for hearing and hear it as fast as we can. So we don't have issues of bail. By the time one wakes up to say, I want to apply for bail, I have my sureties here, it's done. Yeah, so that is how we have tried to avoid it. And actually, we don't have anyone in the warrant of arrest, uh, anyone that we are looking for because we, we released them, they didn't come back to court or go and be arrest, no. And that is how we have money. Thank you. We are going to take notes from Uganda and have that in Zimbabwe. Thank you. <laughs> I think we have time for maybe one more question. Um, so I'll take that question um, here. And then if there are further questions, people can interact obviously with our panelists um, during lunch. My name, is, my name is David. I'm a second year student at George Washington University. International humanitarian law regulates the conduct of war. It provides protection for non-combatants, regulates the torture and treatment of prisoners of war and outlaws many kinds of weapons in armed conflict. But the rules of war do not encompass animals. Do you think it's possible that additional rules can be added to extend many of these rights to non-human animals during armed conflict, such as, such as extending the rights of non-combatants to primates? Did you guys understand the mm -hmm. question? It's, it's hard because there's an echo up here, so I apologize. Um, but I, I think the basic question I'm going to yeah. try to summarize is, um, like the, the international law of war is very human centric and regulates humans. Um, are there opportunities in those legal frameworks um, to dampen or lessen the consequences of war on animals by bringing in animals rights frameworks and principles into, into, those, um, into that area of law? I think that's basically, yeah. Um, I don't think we have any sort of, um, you know, international humanitarian legal experts up here, but maybe just some general reflections. Um, you know, are there different tools or mechanisms, um, behavior change opportunities that exist based on the work that you all have engaged in that could lessen the, the consequences for animals and the suffering of animals in human conflict? Yeah, again, uh, because when we become party to these international you know, obligations, we go ahead and domesticate them in our own countries. So the laws we make, for example, in our case, the Uganda Wildlife Act of 2019, we have made provision for all this to say, yes, we know uh, wildlife may be injured, humans may be injured, but when it happens, this is what is going to happen. If you do it and you do it illegally, you're going to be punished. If you've been injured and you can prove that you are injured from outside the national park, you can be compensated. So, and then we are also increasing knowledge about um, wildlife, their value, how they should be protected, how to report problem, problematic, for example, animals. So I think somehow we are working on it. I think we're probably generations away from not to be too depressing, but generations away from from people really um, from, from decision makers really taking into account um, the well-being of wildlife when it comes to armed conflict. But I think a good place to start is um, what Taylor and Gladys were discussing, you know, enforcing the laws that exist because there are good laws on the books in many countries that just mm -hmm. simply aren't that simply aren't enforced. And then having a judicial system that follows through to the end, because addressing it, addressing the issue, you know, at the front end before the violence starts is obviously ideal. And that's what, you know, everybody wants to work towards, but that's such a big goal. And I think, you know, to start chipping away at it, um, enforcement and completion of the judicial process is, is one of the lower hanging fruits. Since you're a second year student, I might also add that this would be an excellent paper topic. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, okay, I think we have to wrap things up. I think we're we're done with our panel, but I just want to give a big round of applause to our panelists.